It is my pleasure now to introduce Daniel Zoto, a principal investigator at Gray and Pape, which is a CRM firm in Providence, Rhode Island. Dan has extensive experience in New England archaeology, in addition to his work at Gray and Pape. He also volunteers with the Cape Cod Museum of Natural History in Massachusetts. Dan holds a master's degree in archaeology from the University of Connecticut, and today Dan will be speaking about narrow stem tradition projectile points and the woodland period in southern New England. As with our previous lectures, please use the chat or the Q&A features at the end of Dan's lecture to ask any questions you may have about his lecture. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and turn off the video and take it over. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. First, I want to say thanks to Dave for that introduction. Thank you to Scott Brady for inviting me to speak this evening. And thanks to Paul Wegner for setting up the Zoom meeting and for technical assistance. Uh, and thanks, of all, thanks to all of you for spending your Wednesday evening with me. Um, so as Dave said, there'll be time for questions at the end. And uh, today I am going to be talking about um, some of the results of my master's thesis work when I was at the University of Connecticut, which focused on the use of narrow stem tradition uh, tools and the woodland period in Southern New England. Um, so this talk is gonna sum up, summarize some of my master's research and then um, incorporate some more uh, recent work that I've, I've done on this topic. Um, narrow stem points are probably the most common type of projectile point that is found in New England. Uh, they have traditionally been considered to be diagnostic of the late archaic period about three to 5,000 years ago. But research over the last 35 years has established the presence of these points in woodland period context. And that's what I'm gonna be discussing today. Um, personally, I'm interested in documenting the extent that these points were used during the woodland period and to try to come up with some ideas as to why um, this toolmaking tradition seems to defy temporal and cultural boundaries. Um, so today I'm going to provide a very brief overview of the Woodland period, present a case study from the Laurel Beach 2 site in Milford, Connecticut, and then compare the results uh, from the Laurel Beach excavations to other uh, sites other woodland period sites in coastal southern New England. Do my slide. Hang on a second. There we go. Sorry, had trouble uh, changing the slide there. Um, so first thing I want to do is give a, a little bit of background on the woodland period. And this is the period from about 3,000 years ago up until European contact. Um, I want to highlight some of the general trends of this period to put my study into a uh, better context. Um, so the woodland period uh, begins with a time of lower, uh, lower populations. Um, the Population decline in this period is somewhat debated. Some researchers argue that uh, diagnostic artifacts of this period, the early woodland, are not recognized. And that's why we don't have a lot of sites dating to the beginning of this period. Uh, while I certainly agree with that, and, and that's going to be part of my topic today, uh, there's also a dearth of radiocarbon dates associated with the time from about 3,000 to 2,000 years ago that is really yet to be explained. Um, so the, the early woodland period, or the woodland starts off with, with lower populations. Um, you have broad exchange networks. People are being influenced from the Ohio Valley. You have a lot of chert and other exotic materials coming into southern New England from New York State. Uh, people are focusing on river and coastal environments, uh, which become more important as this period progresses. Uh, by the Middle Woodland period, about 2,000 years ago, you have uh, people very much focused on estuary environments, uh, coastal flats that produce a lot of shellfish. We see evidence of this in um, large accumulations of marine shell that we refer to as shell middens. Um, there's an increased level of sedentism 
throughout this period. People are, are settling down as populations grow and they're focused again on, on, on the coastline. Um, and by the end of the woodland, we have clearly defined group territories. People are residing within a particular drainage or estuary. Um, and I'm gonna present some, some evidence as to, as to why we see that. So the, the things to think about is we have, in the beginning of this period, we have um, a lot of exchange, uh, lithic materials moving around. We have a trend toward increased sedentism and settling down over the period. Now, one of the major uh, taxonomic and chronological issues with the woodland period is the use, the continued use of narrow stem tradition points from the late archaic. And these points are very common at late archaic sites, they're very often associated with, with dates from between three and, and 5,000 years ago. Um, and, you know, narrow stem points are, because of that, they're often assigned late archaic period dates, even when they, in the, if they're not found with either ceramics or radiocarbon evidence that uh, says otherwise. Um, interestingly enough, when William Ritchie, the state archaeologist of New York, defined the narrow point tradition, which he referred to as small stem points or the Scopnacket complex, he acknowledged that they were found in um, Shelbin contexts that were securely dated to the late woodland at some of the sites that he, he used to define this, uh, this tradition on Martha's Vineyard. However, the majority of the points were found in the late archaic horizons, and he, uh, he defined the complex as a discrete archaic manifestation. And other researchers have <clears throat> tended to, to follow this, um, considering narrow stem points to represent the late archaic period, um, sometimes even when they're found in association with ceramics or other woodland period diagnostics. And it seems like aside from a few researchers, uh, the possibility of a woodland association with these points, um, especially during the late woodland, it can be ignored. Um, so to investigate these issues with narrow stem points, I'm asking three main questions. Um, were they used throughout the woodland period? And if assuming that they are, what is the geographic distribution of the use of these point type during the woodland? And then why did narrow stem points forms persist while other point styles changed um, during the late archaic and woodland periods? Uh, to address these questions, I, um, I use data from the recently excavated Laurel Beach II site uh, in Milford, Connecticut. So, I don't know if I actually said it before, but uh, the Laurel Beach II site was discovered during a cultural resource management survey that was associated with drainage improvement project, uh, drainage improvement project in the uh, Laurel Beach neighborhood of Milford. This neighborhood tends to flood at high tide and the city was going to raise road beds and put in different drainage pipes and whatnot to, um, to, to help that problem. Um, in order to do that, they were required to do an archaeological survey. And at that time, this was in 2017 and 2018, I was working at Archaeological Services, Archaeological and Historical Services, Inc. in Stores, Connecticut, while I was at, in grad school at UConn. And I directed all three phases of the archeological survey at the site. Um, during the first phase, we identified the shell midden deposit in a shovel test pit and then a close interval verification pit. Um, we later went back and excavated a one meter unit to assess the complexity and integrity of the deposit. Uh, during the first phase, of, of testing, uh, we found a ton of artifacts all over the place, but a lot of them were in disturbed context. This is a essentially 
typically a suburban neighborhood. There's been a lot of development and things get jumbled around. So before we determined that this shell midden had historical significance, we needed to uh, make sure that it was, had been unaltered from all the development that happened in the neighborhood. So we went back and we, we, we dug a little more and we found out that the, the midden did have uh, good context. And because of that, and that it could not be avoided by the uh, drainage improvements, a small data recovery program was, was conducted. We were basically trying to learn as much as we could about this site be, before it was potentially impacted by the construction. Um, so after the, the phase three was complete, I was in touch with both the city who was the project proponent and the Laurel Beach Association who is the property owner, and I obtained permission to do additional excavation within the drainage project um, impact zone over the course of that winter before the, the construction actually happened. And I used all of that data for my master's thesis research. Um, so here I have a site map and some other photos for, from, the, from the Laurel Beach 2 site. Uh, the site consisted of a 20 to 25 centimeter thick uh, shell midden deposit. Uh, you can see that on the profile photo on the right. Um, there is a bunch of road fill on top. Then you have a lens of black soil with a bunch of white specks. Those are the shells and a natural sort of a natural um, B subsoil horizon below that. Uh, the shellman was very close to the road. It had a lot of road fill on top of it. And in that top horizon there, you can see a big gray dip in the corner. That's actually um, a hole from a fence post or a, a road sign. Um, anyway, so overall we excavated about 30% of the shell midden as it existed within the drainage project. If you look at the map on the left, you can see the, the midden was located near the intersection of two streets. Um, during the phase three, we dug two uh, trenches just through the fill to expose the top of the midden and try to figure out the extent of it. And once we did that, we excavated additional units and what we thought had the uh, densest concentrations of shell. So during this excavation, um, I observed some distinct differences um, as well as similarities between the artifacts that were found within the shell layer and within the soil below it. Um, quartz cobbles were being reduced and narrow stem points were being made both within the shell midden and in the soil below it. Uh, ceramics were found within both horizons and um, the predominant lithic materials were quartz and red brown shirt in both horizons. Um, the presence of ceramics um, both within and below the shell midden suggested a a late woodland period date. Um, I must say I was guilty of associating the narrow stem points at this site with the late archaic period, which they are, are traditionally assigned. Uh, the image I have on the bottom right there shows the, uh, the quartz cobble reduction sequence um, from the site. So people here were taking uh, complete quartz cobbles and producing small narrow stem points from them. Um, move on to dating the site. The phase three excavations had funding for one radiocarbon date to be obtained. And I chose a hickory nutshell from the vertical center of the shell midden to get a general date for this deposit. And surprisingly, this returned a radiocarbon age of about 900 years ago. Um, this is a date that is securely within the late woodland period, and it ended up raising a few more questions than it answered. 
um, with the center of the midden dated to the late woodland, which is particularly late in the sequence of, of pre-contact history, um, did the entire shell midden deposit date to that period? Um, was this midden stratified, meaning was the, the lower levels of the midden older, younger stuff at the top, some of the you know, sites you read about in the, the older literature? Uh, did, we, did we have one of these that could be a, an absolute gold mine? And probably the biggest question was, if the shell midden dated to the late woodland period, what were all those narrow stem points doing in there? So when I was at UConn, I um, was very fortunate to have Brian Jones as one of my advisors. And we talked a lot about this site and we talked about the, the radiocarbon date when it was returned and you know, the questions that I had um, from this information. And Brian suggested that I apply for analysis funds through through the uh, friends of the Office of State Archaeology. And I successfully uh, applied for a grant and was able to obtain two more radiocarbon dates from the site. So I can thank Brian and, and thank FOSA for that. Um, I was very careful in my selection of materials to date. I chose another hickory nut fragment um, from the basal layer of the shell midden um, to try to determine when it began to accumulate. And because I was still thinking about all those narrow stem points that were in it, I made sure that this sample was from the same 50 centimeter quadrant and five centimeter level as one of the narrow stem points as an attempt to, to date this artifact as well. Um, and this hickory nutshell uh, returned a radiocarbon age of 850 plus or minus 30 BP. Again, um, a late woodland date. And these two dates actually um, overlap quite significantly and are considered to be statistically identical, meaning that the entire shell midden uh, was securely dated to the late woodland period. So that was that was pretty cool. Um, the second sample that I submitted for radiocarbon analysis um, from the FOSA funding uh, was a piece of hardwood charcoal uh, that was collected from the B horizon below the shell midden. Um, I wanted to uh, basically date the date the sediments that were below the, the layer of shell, but again, thinking about the narrow stem points, I chose a sample that was from the same level and quadrant as one of the narrow stem points that was recovered from the, from the site. This sample returned a <clears throat> radiocarbon age of 2,110 plus or minus 30 BP. Uh, this falls within the final centuries of the early woodland period. Um, so right there we're thinking, okay, we have a a stratified site where we have uh, older materials um, below this accumulation of shell that's been dated to the late woodland period. Also within these subsoil horizons was a quartz Fox Creek point and these are associated with the middle woodland period. So the, the soils below were given um, a sort of general early to middle woodland period date. The radiocarbon dates from the last century of the early woodlands um, and the Fox Creek date is, you know, the Fox Creek point is, can be firmly assigned to that period. So with these lines of, of evidence, um, we now had a stratified site that had, um, evidence of quartz cobbles being used to make narrow stem points throughout the occupation. At all time periods, people were, were making these quartz narrow stem points at the site. And we also had um, red-brown chert both below and within the shell midden. 
um, as well as, as ceramics, which unfortunately I'm not going to really talk about today. Uh, but I, I found this data set to be a good opportunity to investigate changes in, in stone tool use uh, through time, specifically the manufacture of narrow stem points and the acquisition of chert raw material. So in, in order to, to investigate this, um, I did a quantified analysis of the shell, the, the artifacts that were within the shell lens and then those that were recovered from below it. Um, and then I compared the two. I compared the, the assemblage from the shell mid into the B horizon below. Um, and then I took that data and I compared it to other sites throughout coastal southern New England. Um, I relied on some published data, but I also relied heavily on data from cultural resource management studies. I'm a CRM guy and I know that there's a lot of good archeology span uh, done under CRM contracts that unfortunately never sees the light of day. Uh, so I made it a point to try to use what I considered to be um, an untapped resource and, and try to bring some of that information um, to light and I would say I encourage other people that are doing archaeological research um, to, to do the same, to contact their state historic preservation office and see what, what information might be, might be available. It, um, unfortunately, time and, and money doesn't always allow for it to, to all be published. Um, so anyway, um, as I, I previously mentioned, I, I really focused on the the lithics or the, or the, the stone materials um, at this site to answer my questions about about um, about narrow stem points in, in the woodland period. And I approached this assemblage using multiple lines of investigation and in hopes that they would sort of uh, serve as a as checks and balances um, between them. I didn't want to just look at the points or just look at the bifaces or the raw material. I, I tried to to really um, to look at it all. And I conducted separate analyses of the different sub assemblages, again, the shell midden and then the soils below, uh, and then compared the two. So um, in total, we had almost 900 uh, stone artifacts recovered from this site. Um, 232 of them were recovered from the shell midden, 666 were recovered from the um, from the horizons below that. Uh, we had many different um, artifact classes um, at this site. Uh, the most common was debitage. These are the flakes of, of stone that are the byproduct of stone tool production. Someone's flint napping, you got all the little um, chips and pieces that come off and there's really a lot of information that they can contain. So I, I did an in-depth analysis of that. We had cores, bifaces, um, projectile points. I looked at all of those. I looked at um, what I consider to be their discard threshold. At what point um, were they considered no longer useful and thrown away? And um, that can be useful in determining um, the value of that stone at, at a particular time. Um, I looked again at raw material. Um, what types of stones were being used for what purposes at the site and where um, might they have come from. So the lithic analysis started with the, the chips and, and flakes that are the byproduct of, of stone tool production and maintenance. Um, and the, the analysis of, of this artifact class indicated that different raw material packages were being used um, to produce the quartz and the chert tools at the site. Um, I looked at the different attributes of, of the flakes. Uh, the first was the striking platforms, and these are the areas um, where these pieces are hit as they are detached from the larger piece of stone that is being worked, and they can give an indication of the, what that larger stone looked like, what, what type of, of material is, um, 
is being worked at the site. I found that with the chert artifacts, most of the striking platforms were compl complex. They were either bifacial, multifaceted, or abraded. And these types of platforms are indicative of the later stages of tool production or the rejuvenation or, or maintenance of stone tools. Uh, and they, they indicate that the chert at the site that was being worked was already in the form of bifaces or um, partially reduced flake blanks. Now, in contrast, the quartz, most of the quartz platforms were either flat or they had a cortical surface. Um, the cortex is the outer surface of the, the outer weathered surface of the rock. Um, <clears throat> and this indicated that earlier stages of uh, reduction were happening with the, with the quartz. And, and actually just, you know, from the excavation, without doing in-depth analysis, we knew that um, quartz cobbles were being reduced um, all the way into um, projectile points at this site. So anyway, I get back to that in a second. Uh, I then I looked at the amount of, of cortex on the flakes and the type. Um, only one of the chert flakes had any type of cortex or the outer weathered surface. And this was more indicative of a primary bedrock source, um, suggesting that the, the quartz was obtained from a rock, uh, excuse me, the chert was obtained from a rock outcrop rather than being picked up um, in a river along the shoreline. In contrast, um, all of the uh, quartz cortex was of a smooth cobble variety, which is indicative of river or shoreline rocks, um, secondary sources. Um, and this, well, actually, never mind. I'm going to move on to cores, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> the core analysis support a similar narrative. Um, <laughs> sorry, we, I have someone at my door and my dog's barking. No. Sorry about that. Uh, we never get visitors. It's quarantine. Um, <clears throat> anyway, where was I? Talking about cores at the site. The core analysis was, was really important. Um, because it, it determined a few things. For one, it confirmed that quartz cobbles were being brought to the site and reduced into uh, narrow stem points. It also confirmed, um, well, hang on. Sorry, this, this analysis um, really showed the difference in the discard threshold between the quartz and the chert at the site. The one chert core that was found is shown on the lower right hand corner there and it is a very small uh, multi-directional core that is completely exhausted, meaning it is been worked down to a size where flakes of a, a usable size can no longer be produced to it from it and then it is discarded. In great contrast, uh, the quartz cores that were found um, were all cobbles. Some of them only had a few removals and then were discarded. And there were two um, completely unmodified quartz cobbles that were found at the site. And these you know, seemingly natural rocks varied uh, greatly from the natural stone that was in the soil horizon, in these soils that was all angular and it was um, schist or shale. These quartz cobbles really stood out and suggested that they were, were brought to the site. Um, the difference in, in the discard threshold here suggests that the court, the chert rather, sorry, was much more highly valued than the quartz um, at the site. The quartz was uh, seems to be readily discarded, suggesting that there was not a lot of uh, cost in acquiring this material, where the 
shirt is the equivalent of having a pencil that you resharpen all the way to the eraser. It's your, it's your favorite pencil. Um, I'm gonna get back to the raw materials in a moment. Um, I looked at the bifaces in both sub-assemblages and the, the shell midden contained these four quartz bifaces. Um, some of them appeared to be the center of quartz cobbles. Um, the biface that is second from the right has a tapered base and somewhat of a prominent medial ridge, suggesting that it may um, have been intended to be a narrow stem point. Um, other sites in Eastern Massachusetts have found narrow stem preforms that are worked from the base forward toward the tip. This seems to fit that pattern. There is a, there was another uh, quartz biface from the B horizon. It's the second one from the left there that has a similar uh, tapered base and prominent medial ridge, which is probably a narrow stem uh, preform. There was only one shirt biface that was recovered from the site and that is shown in the center of the lower um, photograph there. This artifact was, was really interesting. It was a, a very large thick flake that had been uh, bifacially worked around, around its edge. Um, and then, you know, it was it discarded in a state where it clearly could have um, been further reduced into a more formal tool. It also could have been used as is, as a knife or, or cutting implement and Based on the, the debitage analysis and the other chert artifacts that were found at the site, this probably represents the form of chert as it arrived at, site, at, at the site. I, I mentioned earlier it arrived as either bifaces or partially reduced flake blanks, and, and we, um, we found one in that, that lower horizon. Um, there were a a total of 10 projectile points recovered from the Laurel Beach 2 site, 80% of which were narrow stem points. Um, almost everything was made of quartz, except for the one rhyolite point with the long, broad side notches on the top, second from the left. Yeah, second from the left. Uh, this is was typed as a cape stemmed point. Um, and unfortunately, these are also are not very diagnostic. There is one site, the Karn site on Cape Cod, that these site, these points have been where these points have been radiocarbon dated. And unfortunately, there are 11 different uh, dates from that site and ranging between 2400 and 600 years ago. And this point was just found generally associated with them. So it, 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 it doesn't help date the midden, but we have the, we have the radiocarbon evidence here. Uh, an important thing about the narrow stem points in both sub-assemblages is that a lot of them have asymmetric use wear, meaning one side of the blade was used and resharpened more heavily than the other. And they also have lateral snaps. Um, the tip breaks off, but at an angled way, which is shown on the bottom um, far right and third from the right. Um, and both of these wear patterns are indicative of being used as a knife or a cutting implement rather than a projectile. Um, and and I, I think that using these tools as um, as knives or, or gravers like Jeff Boudreau and, and other researchers have, um, have presented, uh, may be one of the reasons why they continue to be used for such a long time. Um, sort of a, an artifact class like a, like a scraper, which is, is cross-cultural and, and does not um, necessarily change all that much from different stone tool making traditions. Um, now, getting back to the raw material sources, uh, which I thought was it's 
important to figure out where these stones are coming from. Uh, the first thing that I did was do a little reconnaissance survey around, around the site and around the, the Housatonic River estuary. I checked the shoreline um, on the east side near the site and also walked the beach um, out on Milford Point. And I found about three quarters of a mile to the southwest of the site, I found a very long gravel lens that had an ample supply of quartz cobbles that were had a comparative, comparable size and types of cortex to the ones that were record, uh, found at the site. And I assume that this is where the quartz cobbles found at Laurel Beach were originating. A, source like this being very close could have easily been picked up on foraging excursions around the estuary. People are going out to shellfish or fish or hunt or collect other wild plant foods or, you know, do whatever they may be doing, could easily pick up these stones and bring them back to, to the site to be, be made into tools. Um, what was also very apparent um, after walking um, this, you know, for hundreds of meters along this gravel lens is that uh, chert was not available in the local area. So I began looking for a source um, of this red brown chert and I'd seen a lot of it in Connecticut and thought that it, it might be uh, local. I, I first consulted you know, some uh, publications on New England lithic materials or lithic materials in the Northeast. And I found a possible candidate in the Norman Skill chert formation, particularly, specifically the Indian River chert. Um, again, I was very lucky to have uh, Brian on my committee and he happened to have a big sample of this Indian River chert and he knocked a flake of it off for me, um, which I compared to uh, artifacts that were found at the Laurel Beach site. And you can see the photo on the right there. Um, the larger flake to the left is the sample of Indian River chert from Kingston, New York. And the two flakes, I might have said that backwards. Anyway, the two flakes on the right are flakes from Laurel Beach. And they're very similar in texture and color and general composition. Um, to test this theory that that maybe that New York may be where these um, this chert material is coming from. Uh, Dave Leslie and I decided to test these and, and some other lithics um, with XRF technology. And this, um, we did that at, at UConn. And this technology will provide the geochemical um, makeup of a, of a particular stone. And the results demonstrated that there were considerable similarities between the known sample of Indian River chert and the artifacts from Laurel Beach. However, it wasn't an exact match. Um, however, I imagine there's some variability um, within a stone source. And you know, who's to say that the sample that, that we had um, came from the exact outcrop um, that was used prehistorically? Um, but anyway, they were they were close enough that it was uh, it was another line of evidence pointing pointing toward the Hudson Valley. There were also a small number of greenish gray and dark gray chert flakes that were recovered from the site that also looked like Norman Skill chert. So we, I think that together they support um, a connection between uh, the people living at Laurel Beach and the mid Hudson Valley. A little fast. Um, so to do, do a quick recap, um, at the Laurel Beach site, we have a shell midden horizon that was securely dated, water my mustache, securely dated to the late woodland period. Um, we have a subsoil horizon that was radiocarbon dated to the end of the early woodland period, had other diagnostics, diagnostic artifacts dating to the middle woodland period. And we had uh, the evidence of quartz cobble reduction 
and narrow stem points throughout the history of the site. And we also had um, shirt raw material um, used throughout the, the occupation of Laurel Beach. Um, there was, however, a significant difference in the amount of chert in the earlier horizons uh, when compared to the late woodland shell midden. Um, the, the earlier occupations um, contained about 39% of chert compared to 17% within the late woodland horizon, um, the late woodland shell midden. Uh, we did a statistical test to determine that these uh, ratios were statistically uh, significantly different um, so that the, basically that what, basically what I'm getting at is the people during the earlier occupations had a better connection to church sources in the Hudson Valley than later people. Um, Later people seem to be relying more heavily on quartz cobbles as a source of raw material. And this may be related to general trends of sedentism that were occurring throughout the woodland period. Um, as people are settling down more, they might be moving around, though they're settling down more, moving around the landscape less. Um, they may have less restricted or more restricted access to other raw materials and be forced to rely on those that are locally available. In this case, um, quartz is, was the local material available at the Housatonic River estuary. Um, I'm going to get into that a little bit more um, when I make my regional comparisons next. So I took this evidence from Laurel Beach and I made comparisons with other woodland sites from across Southern New England. And collectively, the goal of this was just put the Laurel Beach site in a more of a regional context. Um, but also I was looking for other examples of narrow stem points that had been found in woodland period context. Um, and, you know, thankfully I, I I was able to find that. So the first thing I did was compare this site to other, um, other sites in the lower Housatonic Valley. I started close and I worked my way um, eastward. So in the lower Housatonic Valley, I relied heavily on data that was obtained from the Iroquois pipeline um, cultural resource management project. And this was a very long linear pipeline survey that extended um, through portions of the Hudson Valley uh, into Connecticut and then down the Housatonic Valley um, all the way to Long Island Sound. And the data from this, um, this survey fit, had some interesting patterns that seemed to fit pretty well with uh, Laurel Beach. So in the lower Housatonic, um, they found numerous sites that dated to the woodland period based on the ceramic and radiocarbon evidence. However, there was a general lack of projectile points that were are traditionally associated with the with the woodland period. Um, and this led the researchers to believe that narrow stem points might be the everyday point of the early and middle woodland periods in, in the lower Housatonic Valley. Uh, what was else was really curious about this is they had a lot of late woodland sites um, or late woodland components at different sites, again, known from, from radiocarbon evidence. Um, but a general lack of Levana triangles, which is generally a, a hallmark of the late woodland period. Um, they didn't go as far as to say that narrow stem points were being used in the late woodland. They didn't have good uh, radiocarbon association um, to, to say that like, like we do at 
at Laurel Beach. Um, the other really interesting thing about this survey is they were working in both the Hudson and the Housatonic River Valley, and they were uh, comparing lithic raw materials between the two. And they found that during the early and middle woodland, there was a lot of Hudson Valley chert that was coming into the Housatonic. And by the end of the middle woodland and into the late woodland period, uh, that had almost completely fallen off. Uh, people were relying very heavily on uh, local lithic materials only, namely quartz and the Housatonic. Um, in the Hudson River Valley portions of the survey, uh, Levana triangles were, were very prominent and, and made of chert, and just didn't see that at all in the, in the Housatonic. Um, moving a little bit further east, um, I looked at the lower Connecticut River Valley and I relied heavily on Kevin McBride's dissertation. Um, he found a general pattern of increased sedentism and reliance on coastal woodland, uh, coastal resources throughout the woodland, similar pattern to the Housatonic and Laurel Beach. Uh, he also found a continued use of quartz cobbles to make narrow stem points um, from the late archaic through the first half of the middle woodland period, um, at which time people switched to making Levana points. What I thought was absolutely fascinating about this is the switch to Levana points in the lower Connecticut coincides with an influx in um, exotic lithic materials, namely shirts from the Hudson Valley. So it, it seems that when the connections between the Hudson and the Housatonic are waning during the middle woodland period, um, they are intense, the connections between the Connecticut and the Hudson are intensifying, um, which is, is pretty fascinating. Um, the presence of narrow stem points in the late woodland was not entirely absent from the lower Connecticut River Valley. Um, during Lucy, Lucy Lavin uh, reanalyzed the old lime shell heap and she found quartz cobble reduction and narrow stem points at several of the late woodland activity areas at that site. And she found some really compelling evidence um, that consisted of two wading river type points, which are our narrow stem tradition and late woodland sabonic phase ceramics included in a burial at that site. And that's a, a dated sealed context with the inclusion of, of narrow stem points in a burial, seemingly important artifacts. Um, and another thing I thought was very interesting about the Lower Connecticut River Valley is during the early contact period, um, the Hudson Valley chert seems to totally disappear and there is a resurgence of a quartz cobble industry that uh, Kevin McBride described as used to produce narrow comma stemmed points in, um, in his historic Hackney Pond phase. And I think this resurgence of an old technology, it may be related to um, reduce mobility um, at that time. We know that people were living in defined territories during the contact period. And if trade relations or whatever, um, whatever context or relationships they had with the people in the lower Connecticut and had with the Hudson had, had fallen apart and the access to church is gone, uh, it seems like they had, had gone back to using the local quartz cobbles and they end up making these uh, narrow stemmed points. Uh, moving further east, we get to uh, we get to my homeland, Cape Cod, and I, I also look at Martha, looked at Martha's Vineyard, which I've only been over there once. Uh, that's a side note. 
anyway, uh, for the Cape, I used data from the early 1980s Cape Cod National Seashore project that was conducted by the National Park Service. I used data from some other uh, salvage work that they did along with um, cultural resource manage work, management work by UMass Amherst Archaeological Services and the Public Archaeology Laboratory. Uh, in terms of settlement patterns on the Cape, we see the same trends as Connecticut. We see an increase in uh, sedentism as the woodland period progresses. People are uh, relying more heavily on coastal resources. Um, by the end of the late woodland, they are living permanently around some of the major estuaries on the Cape, like the, the Nosset Marshes um, or, or Barnstable Harbor. Um, looking at the seashore data, um, the use of narrow stem points in the woodland period is sort of ambiguous. Um, during that survey, um, they, all of the narrow stem points were considered to be, to date to the late archaic period, regardless if they were found in components that had ceramics or other um, woodland period associations. And unfortunately, while the reporting on that is quite extensive, the, the resolution doesn't allow um, you to really dissect those sites and concentrations and, and figure out um, the association of, of those artifacts. Uh, but elsewhere on the Cape, um, there have been some evidence that suggests that narrow stem points were used during the woodland. Um, at the Locust 10 of the Karn site, there was a single narrow stem point found in, on a site that otherwise dated exclusively to the middle woodland period. Um, the, the point was thought to maybe represent the late archaic, maybe, um, maybe be associated with the, the early woodland, um, which there were early woodland and, and the majority of that site was really um, uh, middle woodland components. At the Mattaquanson purchase site in Chatham, which comprised entirely of the late woodland, had an entirely late woodland artifact assemblage, a single radiocarbon date from that site of 560 plus or minus 50 BP uh, was obtained on a cornel of current corn, excuse me, which um, again signifies the, the late woodland. Um, and that site contained a single uh, narrow stem point. Um, again, suggestive, not um, definitive. Um, at the Rose site in Truro, there was a shell midden that was excavated by Ross Moffat in the 1950s. Uh, he had narrow stem points that were in the two lower levels of that midden associated with early woodland artifacts and then middle woodland Fox Creek phase artifacts. Um, and on the mid cape at the Fox Front 3 site in Mashpee, uh, it was a large um, sort of discontinuous shell midden that dated, um, that spanned the, the woodland period. Um, there were two narrow stem points found there um, that the excavators thought most likely dated to the woodland period. And, and they even went as far as to say it would be unwise to attempt to define a late archaic occupation based solely on these two points, um, which I thought was, was kind of cool. Um, so collectively, the evidence from from the Cape um, is suggestive that narrow stem points were used in some capacity uh, during the woodland, um, but it's not, um, it's not definitive by, by any means. Um, however, there is some really clear evidence of the late woodland use of narrow stem points uh, from the town of Aquina on Martha's Vineyard. At the Gearhard site, which is primarily a late woodland and contact site overlooking Menemsha Pond, which was excavated by the Public Archaeology Laboratory in the 90s and early 2000s, um, narrow stem points dominated the chipstone tool assemblage at that site. Um, as far as diagnostics, 34 out of 39 points were um, narrow stems, levanas and untyped triangles were the second most common. And uh, the most compelling evidence at that site is that there were 12 narrow stem points that were concentrated or, or associated with a series of post molds 
um, one of which was dated to 420 plus or minus 60 BP, uh, which is a terminal woodland or contact period date. And elsewhere at the site, Levana and other triangle points were recovered in, in general association with narrow stem points. And that led the, the researchers to believe that the um, narrow stem points were used um, in, the, in the late woodland at, at that site. Um, so sort of to wrap it up, because it's been, it's been an hour. I'm sure you're all tired. Um, <laughs> I, I think the narrow stem points were made and used throughout the woodland period in coastal areas of Southern New England. Um, again, not saying that all narrow stem points date to the woodland period. Um, I think there is a strong case to be made that a lot of them, not a strong case, a lot of them are um, late archaic. However, in the absence, when, they, when they're found in ceramics or in the absence of radiocarbon evidence, um, I don't think that they can be used as 100% um, diagnostic of, of either time period in, in reality, there's about a 5,000 year span that these things are, are made and used. And I just want to say that their diagnostic value is, is limited. Um, I think the persistence of this technology is related to access to raw materials. Uh, quartz is probably the most ubiquitous natural raw material across Southern New England, there is a limited amount of things you can do with a quartz cobble. Um, and the most common thing is you make a small um, stubby point that, you know, you, well, you can use as a projectile, but it seems like wear patterns indicate a lot of them were used as, as knives and gravers. And I, I said it before, but they might be more of an artifact class in line with a, a scraper um, that will you know, continue to be used unchanged even as other point styles change for whatever reason. Um, that is about it with my conclusions. I want to say thank you to, again, to Scott and Dave for inviting me to uh, participate in the winter lecture series. And I want to thank my graduate advisors, um, Brian, Kevin, and, and Dan for supporting this research, giving me advice. I got to thank the AHS crew that helped excavate, James Petzinger, Brianna Ray, Katie Reinhardt, Steph Shallow, Will Sikorsky, and Dave Wilson. Uh, they're the, the unsung heroes. Um, I want to thank Scott Brady, FOSA, City of Milford, and AHS to fund this work. Uh, support and advice from Dave Leslie, Sarah Sportman, Luke, Luke Proctor, and Meg Harper. Steve Johnson with the city of Milford and Terry Kinsella with the Laurel Beach Association. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have right now. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thanks, Dan. So um, like we said at the beginning, if you have questions, uh, please type them into the chat or the Q&A feature. I noticed that there was one question by Lucinda McQueenie for Dan Cruzon's address. I'm sorry, I don't have that, or I would provide it. Um, but I could start off with maybe one or two questions while people are typing or trying to remember back. Um, sure. So, I mean, I guess one of the one of the questions that I have, and it's not really a question so much as a, um, I guess it is a question. Um, you talked about the decreasing amount of chert in at Laurel Beach in the uh, shell midden. Do you think that what you might have is as people are creating the shell midden in a later period, there's actually some chert in the AO horizon that's getting mixed up and that's why you're seeing a, a far decreased amount. Um, and another sort of related question is, you know, you talked about the platform analysis and I think that really shows, like you said, the really different ways and innovative ways they're reducing and using the chert. I wonder if they're also doing some innovative ways of reducing the quartz in both periods, but it's hard to tell because it's quartz, right? 
uh, gun to my head, I'm not sure that I could see a faceted platform, of course. Um, so, you know, that's just more of a lithic analysis. Fair. I miss talking yes. to you about this stuff. So, you know. Yeah, I miss arguing with about rocks with you too. Yeah. I really do. So we're going to do this publicly. Um, awesome. Yeah, sure. um, well, I guess, yeah, I would say that there's, is definitely a possibility that the shirt that is in the midden might have been on the ground surface or whatnot before the the shell um, lens accumulated. And maybe that is why it's it's in there. Um, during my analysis, I looked at the shell midden as one soil package. Sure. Um, and I think that I. I could go back and look at the different levels. I and mean, we excavated it in five centimeter levels. I saw that the, the dates at the, in the middle and the bottom were essentially identical. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess for ease of getting my thesis done on time, I combine that and then combine the B horizon data. Um, so it could be something you could parse out. Um, as far as the lithic analysis, um, I agree that the quartz is definitely a lot uh, more difficult to see things like a bifacial or a, a faceted platform. And I think that the shatter properties of quartz, those things might not even hold up. Some of the flat platforms that I have might actually just be missing platforms. Sure. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that the I think the amount of cortex on the debitage and the other um, the cobbles and the early reduction. Um, I guess that doesn't answer your question. I was no, gonna say, I mean, that, that, that's I, what I, I use, but I, yeah, yeah, they could be doing something fancy. With right. the I, I, I think that it's clear that like there's, they're, they're clearly, like you said, they're reducing the cop from cobbles into uh, the narrow stem or uh, scrapers or other forms from that. Right. So. Yeah, uh, and just, I, I think that when you're comparing across these different types of raw materials, it makes it harder to do so because of the raw material property for some of those analyses to be as meaningful. I guess is what I'm saying. That they yeah, might have I, been doing a reduction with quartz, but it's hard for us to see as an archaeologist. Was it was more yeah. of a comment. I would I would absolutely agree with that. And you know they they the Fox Creek point was also made of quartz there. And, yeah. And those, when you know, I see them out of argillite or rhyolite, they're they're very finely made tools. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I'll I'll stop hogging and uh, lately get some of these other questions. I'm sure I'll have more in a minute too. But that's cool. All right. Um, so I got a question of: Is any further work going to be done at this site? Um, I guess the short answer is. No, um, the site was within the impact zone of a drainage project. Um, that part of it has probably been impacted by the construction. Um, there is a part of the site preserved um, on the private property there. Um, I strongly encouraged the landowner to leave it alone and, and leave it protected for future generations. I will say there's, there's been a ton of archaeology done in Laurel Beach from the 1920s, you know, right up until now. And, you know, unfortunately, when, when we were out there, um, a site, you know, 50 meters away in the woods was actively being looted at that time. Uh, so I, I think that any, any known sites in that neighborhood that can be you know, left in place and, and protected should be. Um, but I think there, there are a lot of collections out there from Laurel Beach that were excavated a long time ago um, that could definitely use some love. And it, it might be worth it for, I don't know, me to go back and, and look at some of those for comparison. So thank you, James. Um, I got more of a comment from Don Brown saying that she has found um, what appears to be Hudson Valley Church, not only as debitage and occasional tools on woodland sites in Fairfield and Westchester counties, but 
pebbles and occasionally small cobbles of these materials show up in glacial deposits. Cobble cortex appears on some of the chert debitage at these sites. Um, that's something I'm very, very interested in. And um, like I, I said, the first thing I, I did when I was looking for a raw material source was uh, take a look around the estuary there. I had, I had heard from other people that there might be chert cobbles there. I, I didn't personally find any and, and none of the um, chert at the site had cobble cortex. Um, but I'm, I'm very much interested in lithic sourcing and especially secondary deposits of, of chert in, in Western Connecticut or, or elsewhere. Um, I, I think in, in this case, I made an okay uh, assumption that it was through um, trade or direct acquisition from elsewhere, but you know, secondary sources are absolutely a possibility. Oh, that question might have been from Ernie Wiegan. We can talk more. Um, people want to email me about any of this too. Um, Daniel.zoto at UConn edu. Um, uh, Scott Brady wants to know, what do you attribute the reluctance by other archaeologists to accept narrow stem as a woodland tradition? Well, I think That's a good question. Um, I think it's just, I don't want to say it's, it's status quo and it's a reluctance. Um, I think the data that's out there about these points um, being associated with the woodland tradition is pretty rare. Um, I know I had to dig really deep and I used a lot of unpublished um, cultural resource management uh, reports to um, to gather some of this information. So it might not be readily available. Um, and I also think it's the, the point typologies, um, although the most recent um, New England typology by Jeff Boudreau um, does indicate that narrow stem points were used throughout the woodland, although unfortunately he doesn't provide um, information of where he got those, those dates. Um, I think people will come around. Uh, but again, I think the majority of, of narrow stem points are probably date to the late archaic. And I think that might be why people make that association on, on site forms or when they find a straight point or whatnot. Thank you, Scott. Real, real quick, Dan. I mean, I think that that's an important um, thing that you just said there at the end and you mentioned in your talk too. Um, I mean, it's hard to put a probability on this, but I think that you've spent a lot of time in the last year and a half looking at this. What do you, could you put a, a you know, what are the odds of finding a narrow stem that's not at the coast? What do you think? Is that more likely a late archaic site into the terminal archaic and early woodland? Or do you think it's, it's too hard to put a probability on that? I mean, I know that's a tough question, but. It's probably too hard to put a probability. I, to be honest, I haven't, since I, I was working with a coastal site, I haven't looked inland all that much. Um, but I know from my own CRM experience of, of sites that I've worked on that have um, narrow stem points, the dates are usually like 4,000 years old inland. Um, some of those are, um, you know, way up the Connecticut River Valley in Massachusetts. Um, I'm trying to think of other places. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to to dig deeper and do a comparison between um, more inland or upland settings and, and coastal environments. I think you just find more woodland sites on the coast in general outside of major rivers. Um, and speaking of looking up further rivers, um, looking farther up rivers, uh, Craig Nelson says it'd be interesting to look farther up both rivers looking at the amount of chert in the late woodland period. It is strange that there was more in the Connecticut River Valley than the Housatonic. I absolutely agree because it's, I think, depending on how people are moving that raw material around, uh, the Housatonic is sort of a hop, skip and a jump away from the Hudson. Um, however, if you're in a canoe and moving along the coast, 
getting to the Connecticut River is not all that much more difficult. Um, and I, I really thought those patterns um, that flip flop in the woodland period with the amount of chert on sites between the Housatonic and the, the Connecticut was really interesting. And I, I you know, wonder uh, what could be happening there. And I really have no idea as to why. So there are some questions in the chat feature too, Dan, if you can pull that up too. Ah. Mm. All right. Zach apologizes because he was late. You didn't miss much. Um, most researchers argue that triangle points are likely arrowheads. Do you think the possible late woodland narrow stems are also arrowheads or dart points or what sort of tool? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that, well, a lot of them at Laurel Beach had attributes suggesting they were used um, as knives for cutting implements. They had asymmetrical blades, lateral snap fractures. Um, and I've seen that a lot elsewhere as well. Um, and I know Jeff Boudreau had published twice on the use of, of small stem tradition points, which are the exact same thing as, um, as being used as knives and gravers. Um, and I, I have definitely, uh, you know, toyed with the idea that narrow stem points may function as arrowheads or projectiles, especially when they're found in association with, you know, big terminal archaic blades like Atlantics and, and whatnot. Um, I don't know. I guess that's, I guess that's what I have to say about that. Um, Chris Danta said, did you see, hi, Chris, how's it going? Um, did you see any ar argillite narrow stem points in the woodland context you looks at, looked at, or did that seem to be more associated with the late archaic? Um, that's a good question. Um, I didn't talk about Narragansett Bay in this, um, but I did look at the Greenwich Cove site and early on um, in that assemblage, in the late archaic and terminal, um, there was a lot of argillite and it, it wasn't there later in the late woodland. That was almost all quartz. Um, but by the late woodland at, at that site, they were making uh, Levana triangles. I believe some of the sites at, on the vineyard um, had argillite um, narrow stem points. Um, but I'm not sure if that is, you know, sometimes we get argillite cobbles out here on the Cape and I imagine the islands are the same or, or if they're, you know, acquired from um, somewhere else. Uh, the two quartz points that I, are narrow stem points I mentioned dated to around 4,000 years ago were those beautiful smoky quartz ones from uh, North Split River Farm. That was a good one. Anyway, um, Lucinda McGuini asks, if I had an opportunity to talk with Jeff Kalin regarding quartz narrow stem points, he has a theory on shape that emerges from the cobble. Um, no, I have not, but I should get in touch with him because I am certainly um, curious about that. And, and I could see um, at Laurel Beach, um, the two preforms that I had um, were clearly the center of cobbles. And I know I've read at least about two traje trajectories of making these narrow stem points where either the, the cobble is reduced and the uh, point is made from the center or um, slices or, or large thick flakes are, are taken off the, the cobble, I think through bipolar reduction and then those are, are worked in the points. Um, and that there are more woodland sites along the coast uh, due to sea level rise. I, yeah, I do agree with that. Um, I think we need to do more offshore work in general, and that might skew the um, 
the idea of the shift to the coast in the woodland period, but I think that um, I think that coastal resources were still important throughout that period. Um, a, a related question to what Chris asked: Do you have have you found any um, narrow stems that are made from chert or jasper, other raw materials at these woodland sites? Um, rhyolite seems to be prevalent. Um, at least in eastern Massachusetts, but I think that's because we have a lot of, of local sure. rhyolites here. Um, you know, I didn't talk about raw materials on the Cape because there are no bedrock sources and we have a, a great variety of, of suitable rhyolites and, and beautiful quartzites and all that that is just found locally in the glacial till. Um, I believe in New York State and, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know that question. Lots of, locus, lots of lamocas are made out of chert in New York State, right? But yeah. That, okay. That's that's what I was thinking. What I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, and it it seems like the lamocas in Central New York do date to the late Archaic period. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I think because we found a jasper narrow stem at a site in Old Lyme um, that's associated with a middle woodland site. Interesting. We'll have to talk more about that. Yeah. Um. I mean, based on the Jasper, I would assume it's probably associated with the Middle Woodland. I mean, it's a, it's a Middle Woodland site. There's no other components. So. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We'll definitely have to uh, talk about that when I when I turn this thing into a paper. Um, we have any other questions? I think that's it. I guess I have one final question. Um, sure. I, I know that I've asked lots, but okay. uh, it's sort of an overarching question. Um, what do you think the possibility is that for multi-component sites uh, in a lot of these areas, not necessarily Laurel Beach, but some of the other ones where there's late archaic occupations and then later occupations too? Sure. Um, well, I would say at I think that's absolutely a possibility. And I would say in general, there are late archaic sites in the Laurel Beach neighborhood. Sure. Um, very close by. Um, and it's possible we didn't find the late archaic site at Laurel Beach too. Um, I would argue since all of the projectile points were either, we have the one middle woodland point, we have the Cape stem point that's not diagnostic, the narrow stem points that are not really diagnostic. Uh, we had ceramics throughout the sequence, except really deep in the B, and all the radiocarbon dates were woodland. I think at least that is probably at least a, a woodland period activity area. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of, and I think that's the, the other problem with the, the narrow stem points is that they're very prevalent during the late archaic. Uh, most sites that we have in New England, especially the large ones, are multi-component and they're not stratified. So it's very hard to, to separate those things out. Yeah. No, I, I don't I know think if that answered. That, no, I, I think that's, that, that's the hardest part here. And I think that what you've shown at Laurel Beach is a good example of a, a really good case for, you know, stratified occupation and no evidence of a late archaic date, right? I'm not sure that you can necessarily say 100% that there wasn't late archaic activity there because the radiocarbon date from the subsoil isn't as secure as the radiocarbon dates from the shell midden, right? Absolutely. Uh, but I think that it's as good a case as you can make with the data, which is, you know, which is as good as it can be, right? It, it, it seems pretty convincing. Um, I think, so there was another question that came up in the Q&A too. Yeah, I saw uh, Jordan Table. Hey, Jordan. Uh, he said, during your research, did you happen to stumble upon any evidence of middle to late woodland sites along the lower Connecticut River that contain statistically high counts of Hudson River chirts compared to local courts? Um, I'm not sure about, well, I guess the answer is, I don't know about statistically. Um, the Selden Island site um, that McBride excavated was one that had a lot of Hudson Valley chert um, in the middle woodland, in the, in the early and middle woodland period. 
um, that fell off in the late woodland. Um, I can't remember the sites off the top of my head, but I, I would suggest reading um, reading the stuff from Kevin's dissertation for some of that. I know at the old lime shell heap, it seemed like quartz was uh, predominant uh, lithic material. Um, and there were a lot of narrow stem points in uh, late woodland activity areas in that at that site. Are there any other final questions for Dan? Well, if there are no other questions, thank you all for joining us. Dan, thanks so much for this great talk. Um, please join us. I believe we have a talk uh, next week. Uh, I, I think it's by Krista Dotzel, uh, who's going to be speaking on phytolith research. Um, I'm not sure if it's next week or the week after. Uh, but we will send out announcements um, soon about the next uh, lecture. And thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care.